Welcome to New Realities. I'm Alan Steinfeld. And this program is about the evolution of our consciousness and how we are expanding our awareness of who we are as human beings. And that's why I'm very happy to have tonight's guest, Judith Glazer. She's written this beautiful book, Conversational Intelligence, How Great Leaders Build Trust and Get Extraordinary Results. You've created a framework for understanding the importance of conversation. Right. And you've kind of dissected the, mm, the elements of a conversation to make it more effective. I mean, we're having a conversation, but there's many levels of conversation you talk about in this book. Many people think of conversations as information. I talk to you, you talk back to me, and we're right. sharing or exchanging information. In fact, dictionaries call it exchanging information. Uh -huh. And I said, that's not what's happening. There's so much more that goes on when we have a conversation. Mm -hmm. And the exciting thing about this book is it goes below the surface into what's the neurochemistry? What are the chemical reactions that we activate in each other when mm -hmm. we're having a conversation? And by understanding this neurochemistry and the connection, people can be better communicators and businesses can function better. Is that the idea? Businesses can thrive. Uh -huh. it's, it's so much bigger, Alan, than what people think. It's uh, better is good, but thriving is extraordinary because we're human beings. And what I've learned is that conversations connect human beings. As human beings have a need to connect more than any other need in the world, wow. more than anything. They will give up water. They will give up food to stay connected. I guess that's what makes us human, this need to connect. I just read right before the show, yes. actually, some research that was done with monkeys. Mm -hmm. So I think monkeys and animals actually have a need to connect as well. Mm -hmm. We're all built for tribal things. In mm -hmm. other words, whether it's ants or whether it's bees, we need to be together. Mm -hmm. That's part of who we are mm -hmm. as part of the animal, animal kingdom. But what's amazing is that human beings have taken this connection and built it into a size of a brain like no other. There's no one else on the planet, no other species that has had a head evolve like ours, and there's a reason. What is that reason? Well, the reason is that <laughs> as our brain grows, and yeah. it has grown through from animal into human, the layers um, of brain have gone from the older brain, the reptilian brain, which is the, you know, it's the very primitive brain that's it's fight instinct. flight. Yeah. Instinct. Yeah, exactly. right, instinct, exactly, right. instinct. And then we have a, 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 uh, an emotional brain, it's called the limbic brain, and that literally grew on top of that, took billions mm -hmm. of years to, to grow, uh -huh. but that creates community. Uh -huh. But that doesn't stop there for human beings. We have other parts of the brain that are fascinating. The neocortex, which sits right up here, is how we think every day, our intellect. People used to call it the left brain and the right brain. That's actually old terminology. Is it? There's no left and right brain? There's no left and right brain. Really? Well, I, well, that's I, news. Mean, I mean, that's great to know. Yeah, I've been, yeah you know, we've all been taught that. So and it, what is it? Well, what is there? So we have... In addition to the neocortex, the neocortex helps us think. It okay. helps us think about what's in the present and what's moving into the future. So that's how we get that stretch into trying new things. Mm -hmm. and so you could call that left and right if it makes you happy. A lot of okay. people still feel the need to say that. But what makes us really human is there's a prefrontal cortex. It's called the executive brain. It's mm -hmm. right under here. Is that the creative aspect? I mean... It's, it's beyond creative. It releases creativity, uh -huh. but it has 11 different functions, some of which as I talk about them, yes. and the guests will listen and hear it and say, oh yes. my God, now I understand where that comes from. So What's, what is it? The the yes, okay. what is that prefrontal first, cortex? First of all, it's where trust lives. Really? Yes. Because trust is not an animal emotion? No. But no. Not in the way it is for human beings. I see. And this is why animals trust other animals to be fair, believe it or not. Uh -huh. A monkey might divide part of their... Uh, banana, uh -huh. and they watch to see if who gets the bigger piece. So I would say that you know there's something about fairness, which could be, do I trust that they're going to take care of me? Right. At that level, that's the animal trust. Okay. Right? But with human beings, it's a lot more because if I say to you, um, I'm going to help you become the best TV star in the world, right? Okay, I'd like that. Sure. You like that? Yeah, you'd like yeah, that. Yeah. And I'd like that too. Okay. Okay. Now you have an aspiration, mm -hmm. and trust is, I have an aspiration and people will live to, into that aspiration. In other words, then you expect me to do things that will help you become successful. Mm -hmm. Human beings have that kind of language. Animals don't say, hey, I'm gonna make you a movie star monkey. Right. You know, it doesn't work that so way. So there's trust, what else is in the prefrontal cortex? So context? in the prefrontal cortex is that belief about trust, and mm -hmm. then that has a lot to do with how we connect to people. Mm -hmm. This is where we have integrity. In other words, do I do what I say I'm going to do? Uh -huh. This is where we have strategic thinking. Strategic thinking means that I can look at the world around me, I can think about the future and say, I'm going to plan to get to that future in some uh -huh. way. The other part of the brain doesn't have that. I see. Right, so that's looking beyond where we are now and planning for it. 
What else? Because I think I might be deficient in some of this uh, <laughs> in strategic planning, probably. Well, uh, I, I don't know about that. No, but yeah, I mean, there are skills I could develop that would bring more success or more better communication because right. we're always working on a communication. Exactly. So what, 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 what makes people better communicators? Well, so this is what is yeah. the part of this part of the brain that is fascinating. We have empathy. That oh. means when we connect to other people, we feel about them, we feel for them, we feel with them. Okay? Right. That, is, that is activated by this um, part of the brain, the prefrontal cortex, and it's got something very special which we only discovered in 1999, and they're called mirror neurons. Oh, yes. You've I heard about, about the mirror, mirror neurons. And mirror neurons is when someone's having a feeling or, or a situation. I'm, I'm mirroring their chemistry. Their, I'm feeling what they're feeling by looking at you. And, and connecting, and this mm -hmm. is where the heart comes in. Mm -hmm. We now know that part of what activates this part of the brain mm -hmm to access all of its capabilities right. is when we feel comfortable with somebody mm -hmm. and our heart starts to beat in a very what's called coherent way. Mm -hmm. It's almost a wave like this. Uh -huh. And if I like you, if I'm feeling you like me and I like you, and I feel that in a point zero seven seconds. We all do as human beings. As human beings. When we meet someone, do I like them, do I not? That fast. It's and not even a word. You can't, you don't say a word as fast as you feel whether So somebody... if you like someone, you resonate with them in your, and if you don't like somebody, your heartbeat is fragmented like this, goes up and down, and it's very ragged. Mm -hmm. It feels like, it looks like fear, it looks like frustration. And that creates a physiology in the body that feels uncomfortable, and you move away from that person. Totally, exactly. And if it's coherent, you move towards that you move person. You move towards that person, right. I see, and you know that in... in Point zero seven seconds. Well, what triggers the, the liking or not liking? What is that? So, within 10 feet, this is the heart part of this equation, that mm -hmm. within 10 feet, I feel that energy from your heart. The heart has... Oh, I actually, you, you actually feel feeling it. I'm feeling me. it. You're, yes, I'm uh, feeling uh, it from here first. But we're not conscious of that feeling. Well, we're not conscious, meaning we don't put the words until we get to 0.17, one seconds. So I'm which is feeling you right there because we're less than 10 instantly. feet. Instantly. And, and, and what would make, I mean, I feel resonance with you, and that's nice, but what would make someone not feel resonance? Is there some triggers? We now know that human beings are scanning each other, and they're little mm. things, everything from whether I look down at you or I look at you, uh -huh. whether I look away from you. Eyes have everything to do with that first connection. I know, if a woman's attracted to you, her eyes will open up brighter. That's correct. Okay. And we know that, we feel, I mean, you may not even know why, <laughs> but we just know, wow, she likes me, right? Yeah, and her eyes, <laughs> and, but, right. but if you look down, so, but what triggers that, those um, type of reactions? Human beings, actually, um, there's a uh, professor, Yuri Hansen, at, mm -hmm. um, Princeton University, uh -huh. who put fMRI machines, that's where they put all the electronics around your head, of two people, and they watched what happened as they were talking. And they noticed some fascinating things. As they started to talk, or just look at each other first, mm -hmm. parts of their brain start to light up. Okay. And the parts that, that are that saying, I like you, started to light up. Um. And so, again, without even words, just being in a room, being next to each other, our brain is already starting to feel, uh, reading these signals, you know, seven. But what makes you like someone or not like someone? I'm watching whether I'm being rejected or Oh, not. you're watching me on a subtle level. On a very subtle level. To at see, you? Am I looking away from, from you? you? Am, am I, I looking down at you? There's that feeling. Am I sitting back and judging you? We can feel if somebody's judging us, even if we can't hear a word from them. And, and I would be judging you. You'd be judging based on our history. You look like uh, someone I didn't get along with, Correct. or you, you look like someone I really like. Exactly. So based on that, I start to build up a, a prejudice, in a sense, a exactly. prejudging of who I think you are. Right. And, 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 and Alan, what's fascinating about this also is that there's research that says that if I get a quick hit that uh -huh. you are like me, uh -huh. and that you, that you like me and are like me, yes. then I start to open up and become more transparent uh -huh. with things that are important. I'm willing to share without that fear that you're going to do something harmful with what I share. Okay. So what if you meet someone, and you talk about the, uh, work, the guy you're working for in your book, where you just didn't connect at all, and yet you're in a situation, how do you... Can you force yourself to like someone that you don't like instinctively? Well, when you like somebody instinctively, you want to lean over and touch yeah, them, hi. right? You, you <laughs> like to be near them, right? Right. You, you start to, and, and when you don't do that, and you go into a place of what's called resistor, uh -huh. where you start to see yourself pulling back, yeah. human beings have a choice. We uh, have, in other words, if we you start, conscious, we're not driven totally by our ins instincts. instincts or reactions. That's right. We have a choice to do what? To just say, should I test that? Do I want to find out if, in fact, maybe I'm carrying baggage from the past? I'm looking at this person, Alan, and thinking, 
God, does he remind me of that guy? <laughs> I didn't like that guy very much. <laughs> right. So, right. So I look so, for comparables. That's how the brain works. Uh -huh. It scans the environment, looks right. to see what it knows, because our brain is designed to know. We have to know what's going on in reality. Because that's our survival. That's our survival. Right. Exactly. So if you look like someone I couldn't trust before, then I'm going to move away and right. put that on you. But if I'm, so you're saying if I'm aware of my prejudices or, or the biases, what, my biases, biases what yes. I come to, then I could then say, I can say, then you want to test it out. But I'm not, but people aren't that aware. They just have reactions usually. Well, after reading my book, people are going to become more aware. So what are the things that people have to become aware of in order to bridge those gaps that will make communication smoother? So what, what I've learned after studying for 30 years around when people communicate well and when they're able to break through these biases, barriers, blind spots, uh -huh. which we all have, mm -hmm. is that there's some simple things that you can do. When introduced to a new human being, if instead of going into judgment, a lot of times we listen to judge another person. Whether you like them or not. Because sometimes you like the wrong person for the wrong reason. Exactly. And it's like, yeah. that's the same mistake. Exactly, as, right. Okay, so. Right. So you, you, to test this, and mm -hmm. I have a lot of experiments in the book that people can do, mm -hmm. but you listen to connect. That's the first thing. So instead of to judge or reject, mm -hmm. listen to connect. And you're going to watch your physiology change. So what does that mean? I'm listening to connect. How do I feel when I'm with this person? With, a, with this person. And to be curious about that person. So I want to discover things about you. Uh -huh. When um, Yuri Hansen did the research and found people getting along, um, they start to ask each other questions. They were curious because right. I like you. I want to know more about you. God, right. you, you know, what do you do? You look like you must be doing great things. Tell me, right. I want to know about your work. Right. So we teach people to think about discovery. I want to discover uh -huh. what's unique about that other human being. But let's say you sat with someone that you weren't so immediately attracted to, or some, and would you would you force yourself to then want to discover that even though you're physiology was saying move well, away? Let me tell you some funny stories. Yes. Okay. Tell me. So I travel a lot. I must okay. travel almost every week on an airplane. Okay. I started to play this game years ago and okay. I said I'm going to sit next to a person and see if all this theory that I write about is really true mm -hmm. and see I'm very close to that person. I'm going to spend three hours together. What happens? Do I feel any uh -huh. connection to that person? So your feeling means you're listening to your physiology. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And if there's something about that person, if they go to sleep, you know, that's another right, thing. Right, right, right. I'm not going to wake them up to find no, out, no, but to test my theory. But mm -hmm. <clears throat> what I will do is I will notice something about them. And then I find all of a sudden I'm noticing something. And, I, and then I get curious and then I have to ask them a question. Okay. And so as soon as I ask that person a question, they all of a sudden, because whoever reaches out to make an entree to somebody else, creates what's called a flow of oxytocin. Talk about some of those chemicals. So oxytocin okay. is the oxytocin feel good chemical. Oxytocin is the feel good bonding chemical, right? What the mother has with child. Or... It was first discovered as a lactating um, uh -huh. chemistry that this is part of what happens when a mother's bonded with a baby and is nursing them. Mm -hmm. She produces a lot of oxytocin, and so is the child. Right. And by the way, babies love that. Right. You know, not that everybody has to nurse. Right. But that happens when a mother holds and coddles a baby as well. And also during sexual relations, that aren't people Extremely. having? Extremely. It's the most frequently produced hormone for men and women. Oh, is by it? By the way, yeah. And that's what people, in a way, get we used to. For. It's the cocktail. So I talk about neurochemical cocktails. Oh, right. Right, right. right. Yes. right. So, what, so what is a neurochemical cocktail? So we start to feel good with people, mm. and it becomes an addiction. Yes. I, very quickly, human beings get addicted. As okay. soon as I'm with somebody, and I, boy, that was the best conversation I've had in years, right? And now I'm going to mark you. And let me just tell you how amazing our brain is. Uh -huh. now, I now have a spot in my brain. If this is our first meeting, there's a spot in my brain that becomes you. Right. Literally, it, it is. Mm -hmm. I hold that in me. And every time I meet you, I start to add data to that right. spot. I know. I have a filing it, cabinet. It's, I know it's exactly. It's a filing yes. cabinet. Exactly yes. right. It's the most. Our brain is the most amazing ever created filing cabinet in the world. There's nothing that organizes mm -hmm. it. So well the person that. that reaches out to the other starts to build oxytocin. Oxytocin levels. Uh, it, it, even it, to anyone. So if I'm because I meet people all the time. I yeah. guess that's why I feel good. Yeah. Is it, so it feels good to reach out to someone it, else. It feels amazing. So you reach out a lot. You're producing I, a lot of oxytocin. You do, I don't am. you? I, I yes. guess I do. I never knew. I, so, I feel good. The, so here's the fascinating <laughs> thing about oxytocin. Um, you know about autism. Yes. And autism is when children have difficulty connecting or reaching out, uh -huh. right? I did work with autism for uh -huh. a while before I got into doing uh -huh. corporate work. And there now is a um, something that you can sniff that's oxytocin sniffing uh -huh. that they give to children. They started it as an experiment uh -huh. to see if it could change autistic kids to make it easier for them to connect. I see. And lo and behold, squirting oxytocin in their nose, these kids began to have collaborative behaviors. Really? Reaching out behaviors, uh -huh. right? They didn't mind being touched behaviors. 
It's fascinating. Wow. So the, an autistic child might be oxytocin deficient, is that what you're saying, or the inability to produce those chemicals? Those chemicals are not, some, for some reason, there's an interesting firing okay. problem about during the connecting phase. Mm -hmm. So getting back to like, you reach out to the person, you produce oxytocin, yes. and then what's the next phase it, of that? It makes it easy to speak, to ask questions, to be curious, okay. to talk. It actually facilitates the collaborative experience, the, what I call co-creation, where people are really engaged with each other. So then the mirror neurons and the other person will then reciprocate and produce oxytocin in them because you're producing oxytocin, I'm producing it, and we're just feeling good together. Is that the, how it the, works? The oxytocin isn't produced by the, neuro, uh, by the mirror neurons. Oh, it's not? No, it's produced by other parts of the body. But is the oxytocin parts. triggered by the... Sim so if, if you're reaching out and feeling good, yes. And I reach out back. And I'm, yeah, you're you reaching out back, then I'm... It's like an exchange of, it's well, like I'm... My chemistry will then mirror your chemistry. Yeah. So it may not be produced by the mirror neurons, but somehow there's a it, triggering. It, there's a triggering. And um, right. what, what Yuri Hansen figured out is that when people start to really get along with each other, the patterns of what was, where blood was flowing, blood flows to certain parts of the brain, and that's what then, that's what masters you at the moment. So if blood is flowing towards more sharing, uh -huh. then I'm going to be sharing more. Well, what makes more sharing? If I share to you and you share back to me, now we've triggered and activated that part of our brain and we want to do more of it. Uh -huh. And then dopamine gets produced. What and that dopamine? feels so good. That's but, a feel good. That's well, is an oxytocin feel good too? It's, it's, it's a collaboration and love and bonding. Dopamine. But dopamine makes you feel, it's like drinking a drink and so, saying, oh, I'm now a how having a buzz. How do you get buzz. dopamine? How do you produce that? <laughs> if, if, you, um, if you get, it's like a reward uh -huh. in the body. So if I reach out, you reach out to me and it feels good, I like it, mm. and I'm not feeling hurt, I'll say, wow, that was great. And so I start to produce more dopamine or adrenaline, which gives me more energy, like I want to do more of this. So all these chemicals are the cocktail that's mm. being produced during engagement or and during sex or during friendship or... So Walking that's, in the woods. <laughs> so that's the upside. But then if you're also bringing this into business, you don't want that much excitement, do you, in business? Because you work with a lot of, you know, corporate people. Yes. So is there a limit you want to put on the oxytocin flow when you're dealing with a corporate? I would uh, prefer not to. <laughs> oh, no, maybe there isn't. So it's the same thing in, in business, you're so saying. So if you look at the evolution of human beings over millions of years. Because you're a, what kind of anthropologist? Organizational anthropologist. <laughs> well, what is, what that? is that exactly okay. before we get into the human being? Okay, that is, so I've studied, my undergraduate was multidisciplinary sciences, but anthropology, archaeology. Mm -hmm. So I actually was on an archaeological dig that was 6,000 years old. Mm -hmm. That's really, that's like pre, pre Where was that? In Czechoslovakia. Wow. I spent three months on a dig with the Czech students, the American students, and a translator. And, and what did you learn about, like, this? People and, and yeah, what goes yes. on here. So um, when you think about where, over, what's happened over the last 100 years and how evolved we are and mm -hmm. the technology we have and the amount of innovation we have, that's only the last 100 years. Imagine way back then, people were nomads going across the land in Czechoslovakia, wow. and they had no innovations. They had fire, mm -hmm. right? They had, they had language, stone. Which they was, had language. That's a huge innovation, it, language. Right, I mean, right exactly. Yeah. They had the FOXP2 gene, which is the language gene. Humans which which do. Noam Chomsky, yes. did he, he discovered that humans have a gene that no other animal has. That's the FOXP2 and, gene. And that's the facility for language. For language, correct. Other animals can make sound, but no other language has it, symbolic. Um, Except they think maybe the whales. And dolphins. And dolphins. I think dolphins, too. Dolphins, too. But anyway, okay, so we had... You're saying we had we language. Have we have language. So the, and it started back. out as grunts and groans. And okay. the, the complexity, when you think about now, every two years, we almost double the amount of language that we have accessible to ourselves. Not Where back then, it was starting with grunts and groans and then so forth. Anyway, so yes. they only had fire. But what we discovered, the Americans were given a plot that uh -huh. was 10 by 10 feet. And we had to dig. Wait, an experiment in this archaeological? In, on this archaeological dig. Oh, okay. The Czechs had been doing this for 25 years on this okay. dig going across the world. Okay. But we were given our little spot to work on. And we found the most important thing on the dig. What was what that? Was that? It was the first innovation used in cooking and community, which was to move from fire to something else. It's a big deal. That's like a leap. That's almost like what, what would the what something else be? Yeah. Well, we found a pot belly stove. You it found was a the stove. first invention, oh. a pot belly stove. In other words, going from just fire to cook food or just fire to do anything and to be able to have a kiln, they made a pot belly stove that was cooking pots. They could now have pots uh -huh. that they could keep as permanent pots right. and start to decorate them. That's but, huge. But don't you need a lot of innovation before you get to a stove? Don't you need to like extract metal from stone? I mean, create Not, a, Well, it was a, it was a, mean, it was a ceramic stone stove. I know, but yeah. I mean, there's a lot of innovation that has we to come into find, civilization. We didn't find anything else but that, uh, but that was the premier 
discovery of the 25 year, if you can imagine mm -hmm. that, dig. And that was 6,000 years old. They 6, had cooking stove. 6,000 years old. They had a cooking stove. Right. That was the first cooking stove. Right. So what does that have to do with conversation? Okay. Okay. Yeah. First of all, conversations have three levels. Okay. We were now learning about level two, which is persuasion. Um, I was observing these guys arguing with each other. Right. Somebody wanted to be right. It's called, right. uh, and later when, as people go through the book, they're going to see, I mentioned a thing called addicted to being right. Right, right, right. right they, yeah. it's one, once we believe yeah. that we have an answer and mm -hmm. we want to own it and it's our ego, right. we are addicted to being right. That's level two. That's what David Data says. All arguments are saying, I'm right and you say. And you're wrong. I'm, I'm right and you're wrong. I'm right. right. I'm right. You say I'm right. I'm right. I'm right. That's, that's our, level that's, two. That's the basis it's of the, all. All many conversations lead to that. Yeah. Because once our ego gets involved, we're stuck there. Mm -hmm. And and in companies, and as you read in families, in any time where you have a culture or community, people get triggered. And that's by the way another dopamine high that you get from being right. Oh, you we're, get high, high from being right. We get right. hugely high, oh. hugely high from this. So. Um, so when I'm arguing with you uh -huh. and all of a sudden I see I have an edge, I'm going to go, it almost takes control of my body, the need to be right. Those chemicals take over. Take and over. It, and it forces that personality to come out. Right. Because it, it, it needs it, that ad it needs addictive it. chemicals. It that does. Feeds. It does. So and school, kids go to school, they get grades. They want to be right. We go to business. We get bonuses. We want to be right. It, but the it's other thing, built in. right? But the other thing, if you're wrong all the time, that also becomes a chemical that gets the body. This person gets used to as well. So, so here's what that does. Yes. This is really fascinating. When I'm wrong a lot and you're right, yeah, I get the part of me that gets triggered is called retribution. Uh -huh. I want to get back at people that have made me feel small, oh. minimized, wrong, rejected. And so if you go into the history of a lot of people that end up in jail and kill right. others, and by right. the way, family members are more frequently killed than anybody else, right. it's because you live in a family. And this is what I'm concerned about and why I wrote the book. We live in families where parents, without realizing it, can look down at a child oh. and begin to run that child's growth around uh, proving oh. that they're wrong or that the parent is right. or telling them that they're not worth anything or whatever it is that the human beings as they're trying to nurture but don't mm -hmm. nurture know how to nurture really right. start to um, make a person label a child as incapable mm. of being good and smart and wonderful so and when they do that the child then will somehow build a need to have retribution get back, get back. Get back. or not even at the parent at the world at the world at at, at the, the world. world, at the world. Honestly. So I watch, I watch a lot of TV shows, and there's so many on right now about you know NCIS and uh, Criminal Minds and right. things like or that. Or bullying. Or bullying. Yeah. Yes, exactly. And so a lot of it is the need to get back at someone. I have a, a an executive that I did a lot of work with, who was a partner in a law firm, very high profile. Um, and it turns out when he was young, I didn't, I didn't like what he was doing. He was very much of a bully, and he had a partner, and he didn't, he wanted to make his partner look bad. It was a woman. And I kept looking at that dynamic and saying, something's going on here from their mm -hmm. past. Mm -hmm. And I finally got him to open up one day, and it turned out he had a sister who was a little bit older than he. Oh. His sister was very bright and beautiful and smart oh, and everything. And he wasn't not quite as much. He was a little uh. bit awkward and gawky, smart yeah. too. Yeah. But she always got the attention. Right. And he was looked down upon by his uh. parents as though she was the princess and he was not. Right. So in his life, when he got paired with this woman, she became... She became the sister, sister, and he needed to make her wrong. Make her wrong. And so yeah. I noticed how so many things he did mm. to trip her So up. how do you change somebody like that? I mean... How do you change them? Well, how would that person change? I mean, I'm I, sure he's not conscious even of what he's doing. He's not, he's not conscious. Um, a lot of times when a coach, which is I do a lot with yeah. senior executives as their coach, you build a relationship with, um, with that person mm -hmm. um, and talk about blind spots and okay. getting insights. And wow. so, anyway, I got him to a place where he started to realize what it was. But actually, the end of the story is the law firm said, we can't have two bosses. Um, who do you think should stay? And I said, she should stay. Oh. That was, so he ended up being asked to leave. So the three, three, level, three yeah, levels of yeah, conversation. Yeah, because I think we can get, to, the last level is the most important, but the three levels are. When we start out, human beings are, are actually confirming what they know. So when I first get to know you, I mm -hmm. want to confirm, I can trust you. So I ask questions or I tell you things, but it's really about me confirming you 
and that we have the same reality. Mm -hmm. So I'll ask you questions. Hey, is that the best restaurant you like? Mm -hmm. Yes, that's so great. So I can is trust that? you because you understand the world the we way are the I, same. And same if, reality. So if I'm in the same reality and you tell me there's a good restaurant, I'm going to trust, trust that you. because you're like me, you're and, like I, me. and I identify. So at what level, what do you that's call that? That's called level one, and that's called transactional. Okay. It's important. It's okay. how we get to know each other. Yeah. Right? And actually, there is the thing called just like me uh -huh. in the brain. You said uh, it. You said it intuitively. Right, right. It right. Is. So you're just like me, and I can trust you. I and can we're trust part you. Of the same right, so group. that's how I check you out. And, and I, right. Bing, 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 bing. Good. Right. 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 Okay. Like the same that's restaurants you land in. Very that's like, superficial level. Right. That's the, but it's, you have to start there. You have to start there. Okay. If you jump over that, you miss a lot. Okay. 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 The next one is the positional level, okay. where you and I, I'm now interacting with you, and we start to have points of view and positions, and I find I want to have a strong point of view. Everybody needs a voice. Right. So not only do I need to feel comfortable with you and trust you, I have to have a voice in this relationship. Okay. Many couples don't do a good job of that. Uh -huh. Many partners don't because one becomes um, its power over uh -huh. others instead of power. So around. one becomes the dominant, it's my voice, Often. and you must agree with me. Often. And if you don't, then I will argue with you. Right. And so how do you change that? Then you use level three. Oh, okay. Okay, so yes. level three is when you, ha it's called the transformational Wait, no, level. level two is called what? Positional. Okay. I, mm -hmm. It's positional power. Okay. I'm, I'm asserting, and it's giving me an identity around my voice. Mm -hmm. So again, there's something healthy when it's done right. Mm -hmm. There's something not healthy when it's done wrong. Right, okay, okay. I get you. Okay. So and, the transfer three. and the transformational level. This is the level where I'm willing to be influenced. Okay. I'm willing to open up my kimono, as they say, and allow you into my world in a deeper level. I'm not proving I'm right. I don't have to know anything about being right. It's about me wanting to be inside of your world and triggering those mirror neurons oh. and knowing that when I trigger that, we'll become more like each other. When I empathize with you, we'll grow together in ways that our brain would never grow in either of the other levels. Oh. This actually grows our capacity to be more human with each other. Mm. We're still evolving our humanity. Of course. So right. I have to decide that that's the kind of conversation I'm going to have with you, right? You choose your level. And then... I choose my level. So let's have a conversation like that, just on that level, level three, right? Where, yes. we're, where we don't know anything except what we can. Actually, the biggest thing that we do in level three is we ask questions for which we don't have answers. Oh, I like that. Isn't that beautiful? Let's have a conversation like that, maybe okay. on the next show. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, but thank you, thank you. Because I think the, the, the thing of level three is to bring more of who we are out. Yes. I've been talking to Judith Glazer. Her book, Conversational Intelligence, it is really a must read. It's how great leaders build trust and get extraordinary results. I'm sure if you read this book, you would get extraordinary results. Thank you for watching. I'm Alan Steinfeld, Judith Glazer. What's your website? Conversationalintelligence.com. Thank you. Thank you.